But how do we get there? How do we get to a point, if we are so conditioned in time and space and all of that, and separate us, how do we get to a point where we see love instead? How do we do that? You know? And what comes along now, and it's interesting, right at the same time in history comes along this, what I consider to be this astonishing document called, lower left-hand corner, A Course in Miracles. A Course in Miracles will, will tell us how. It's got lessons on how to do it. It, is, it explains the entire, the entire problem that we've, we have been faced with all this time. It explains why we are in the state that we are in, um, or at least that we believe we are in. As it turns out, we're not really in that state. We only think we are. Um, and it, it, it puts it, let me back up here. What I don't want to do is sit here and preach A Course in Miracles. I'm not here to do that. The Course in Miracles has a lot of spiritual principles in it which are useful across the board in my view. Uh, but I'm not pushing A Course in Miracles on you. What I'm doing is, is taking some of its principles here and laying them out before you for you to look at and blend in with whatever, whatever practices you think would be useful. So, so let me tell you a little bit about, about the Course. Uh, when I first came in contact with it in 1986, um, by the way, this is, this is what it looks like, okay? And in this book, which is 1,200 pages in very small print, uh, there are three books contained in it. There's a, it's called a text, a, a workbook and a manual for teachers, it's called. And so when I first came across this, I got the book and I'd sit at home and I'd open it up and I'd start to read it and I'd read two or three paragraphs. Yeah, I fall asleep. <laughs> And I, I don't know why I would fall asleep, but I would. I'd just fall asleep. And I looked at the paragraphs afterwards, and there weren't any words in there that I didn't understand, that were brand new words or anything like that. I'd fall asleep. And I, but I, I still kept reading it. So why would I keep reading it? Well, the only way I can describe that is this, this book. It, it was like hearing, hearing this beautiful melody. You are so beautiful but not understanding the lyrics. It just kept singing to me. So I'd read it, and I'd fall asleep, and I'd read it, and I'd, sometimes I'd get a little further into it and all of this. And, I, and eventually I, I learned that the reason I would resist it in this way is because I didn't want to hear what it was telling me. I didn't want to hear that I was deluded. I didn't want to hear that all of my beliefs weren't really true. <laughs> I didn't want to hear it. Even though they have ways for me to get out of this and all of that, I didn't want to hear it. Because I was very much stuck into, you know, the whole idea of the, the separation. Well, I, I kept after it and I kept after it because the song had such a beautiful melody to me and eventually I began to learn what the lyrics were saying. And, and it, was, it was put together in such a magnificent manner. It was, it was put together symphonically. Um, and circularly at the same time. It was like it, was like it was started with, it would, it would uh, give you some concepts to begin with. And then it would go off here someplace and then it'll come back and, and, and touch on these concepts and add another one in there and come back and do this and come back and do this and come back and do this and on and on and on and on, and on it would go. And so I finally realized that what it was trying to do was to take, it was like, it was like Imagine yourself going to an insane asylum and trying to convince somebody who thought they were Elvis that they weren't, okay? That person, even though that person may be a lady, will look in the mirror and say, no, I'm Elvis, you know? And will tell you everything. They are convinced they are Elvis even though obviously they are not. But how are you going to convince them of that? How are you gonna do that? You know, people have tried, psychiatrists and shrinks have tried for I don't know how long to get these people to realize that they aren't what they think they are. And so we aren't what we think we are, and now we have a stunning piece of literature, which was, I didn't mention this, but it was channeled, if you will, and the voice in it, and the voice in it is Jesus. Now, I'm not sitting here pounding the table for Jesus. I don't have any background in the Christian religion or anything like that. But it's a Christian setting, and, and uh, he identifies himself in that he talks about his own crucifixion, resurrection, and all of that. But the whole point here is not, is not, you know, this is Jesus talking to you. I just mentioned that because that's who it happens to be. Um, let me show you something here. 
Yeah, I'm going to show you that. This is one of the things that it says, just to give you a little idea. Uh, we, you know, we tend to think of God as up there in the sky someplace, okay? I mean, that's how we think. We, we, we point to God as God. God's up there. But that's not where God is. But that's, what, that's, that's what we tend to, tend to do. And so, and so there's the sky and, and there's God, okay? <laughs> All right. Now, uh, the way the Course in Miracles puts it, and the way Jesus puts it in, in, in the Course in Miracles, he said, he said, you folks have it wrong as far as, as, as uh, my place in this whole thing. I was not, and this is very clear, by the way, uh, I was not the, um, the Son of God come down to die for your sins on the cross, and as, as so many of the Christian disciplines you know, would, would suggest and believe. That's not what he says. He says, no, 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 no. He said, God has one Son, he calls it. Like that, okay? But one son is not Jesus. One son is everybody. You and I and everybody in this room and everybody you know, et cetera, are all one. We are all part of this sonship, as it is called. Um, now, the, the way I've got it put up here, we're, we're, we're used to seeing things separately. So there's God and there's the son. Okay? That's not really how it is. How it is, as the Course describes, is like this. They are one. Two are one. They are not released. Really, even those are not separated. Um, so we are all part of that oneness, if you will. Now that's just that, that's that's how the course course puts that together. I just wanted to point that out to you. Um, now, let me see where, where else am I going here? In a second. Ah, let's talk about some things that the course says. And, and, and by the way, I'm, I'm giving you a real crash course. I'm giving you highlights here. This is the kind of thing that I've studied for, for a couple of decades now. And, and so these are the, and this is for you to pr pursue from here if you choose. Number one, it says our senses deceive us. You've heard that before, no doubt. Okay. Number two, there is no out there, out there. Sorry, folks, but it sounds like a repetition here, but that's, <laughs> that's on purpose. Okay. We live in illusion. It's a dream. In fact, in fact, there are some beautiful passages in the Course that talk about, talk about dreams. It would say something like, when, you're dream, when you have a dream yourself that you think is a dream, you know, when you go, to sleep, you go to sleep at night and you have this dream, that dream seems to you very, very real, doesn't it? Even though you are violating reality as you know it, Frequently, at one point you're playing bridge with your friends, and the next, in the next point you're in a parachute over Japan, and you think nothing of it, right? Okay. So these dreams seem very, very real, and while you're in them, they're very real. In fact, if we put some kind of measuring devices on you, you'd find out, you know, your adrenaline pumps and all this kind of stuff going on as you're having these quote real experiences. But sooner or later you wake up, and at that point. You know it's not real, don't you? That's the only reason, only reason you know it's not real. You, oh, I was just dreaming. And so if you, had, if you did something in that, in that dream that you would have guilt for, and then, and then the uh, dream is all over, you say, oh, it's a dream? Do you, do, you do you bother having guilt from that point forward? No. No, it was a dream. It was a fiction, OK? And what the Course tells us is we are dreaming now a very persuasive dream just like the dream that we think we have, at, or that we have at night seems real, so does this one, very persuasive, very real appearing dream. And what we need to do then is wake up. All right. There is no time or space. They do not exist. Separate. These next two points are very important, and, and they're going to be very important in the psychotherapy sense, okay? Separation is the only problem there is. There is the, the belief in separation is the only problem that there is. We think we have tons of other problems. We have financial problems. We have trauma problems. We have war problems. We have relationship problems. We have business problems, and on and on and on it goes. We can make long, long lists of problems. But all of those are contained within the whole idea of separation. If we believe and understand and we wake up, those problems disappear because they aren't there. This is a dream. Okay. 
Separation is the only problem. And forgiveness is the only, is the solution to every single problem. But let me point out something. We're not talking about forgiveness in this case. And by the way, all, the, all, this, all this attaches to this new psychology I'm talking about. I'm gonna summarize that here in a little bit. Um, but for, forgiveness in these other terms isn't something like you come up and kick me in the shin and I go, oh my God, I, I hate you, I don't like you anymore, shame on you, da da da, da. I don't like you. And, and later on, you know, I say, well, okay, you were having a bad day, you kicked me in the shin, I fly for you. That's not forgiveness. Because what I'm really doing there, and think about it, I'm keeping score. You kick me in the shins again, and you're, gonna, you're really gonna get it, okay? <laughs> yeah, that's the second time you did that, and so on. Forgiveness in course terms is to wake up and to recognize that none of it ever happened. It never happened. Okay, so, so that reduces the entire psychotherapy process down to two things. There is one problem and one solution. That's it. Okay. But is that practical? Are you going to go to your clients and say, gee, uh, this is all a dream. You really don't have those problems. If I were you, I wouldn't pay your mortgage. It isn't there. You know? Well, that's not going to work. It's not going to work at all. Now, for some clients, because they're a little farther along the line, ah, they'll, they'll get some of this and they will move along with you. Okay. Others, no, no, no. Stay right where they are. Stay right in the dream. But sow a seed or two to take, take them along the road. Now, this is my suggestion along all this, um, is that rather than lay this trip, if you will, on our clients. We understand it for ourselves first. You see, if, 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 you get, if you get closer and closer and closer to the point that this is a dream and your real reality is love and nothing else, yeah, you're going to fight with your ego and your sense of separate and all that kind of stuff, but the more you work on it, the more spiritual, if you will, you become, the more spiritual you will appear to the client and you will start to have an understanding of where that client is. It's going to be a lot different than it used to be. Okay? And so, so when you're visiting with that client and all you can do is sow a seed, sow the seed because you know where, where you're going eventually. And they'll start picking that up from you. They will understand and see from the rapport point of view, from the ambiance point of view, ah, oh, there's something special, there's something different about you, there's something, and they want what you have. And so the point here is not to lay it on all these other clients, lay it on ourselves, and gradually bring it out to clients, those that can use it. This is where I think we're going to take this whole field to a brand new level. This is where you will develop guidance in your sessions. Um, where you'll start to be able to pick up those core issues like that. You know, boom, there it is. Instead of sometimes taking session upon session or weeks or months or something to finally land on the core issue, ah, it shows up, you know. Uh, I've had a lot of people comment because they watch my own videos and, and they'll say, well, Gary, how do, you, how do you get to those core issues so quickly? And I, th I think it's because I spent a lot of time doing this and I've got a lot of guidance going on. And so I just get notions. How many of you get, get notions when you're doing EFT? And, 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 yeah, raise your hands up there, okay? See, that's about half of you, approximately. And so the, the more we can perfect that, the more these ahas come up, the quicker we get there, and the more efficient we will be. And I think that that's our next mega leap in this whole field. But it's working on ourselves as that then translates to all the clients. Okay. I want to end this. I want to end this with a practical way of going about getting there ourselves. Um, I'm going to tell you three stories. They're going to be stories about what I call miracles. Uh, of course, in miracles, I happens to call them um, holy instants, and they are points in time. As I tell you these stories. I, my hope is that you will recognize your own stories where these own little spikes of love have occurred that is outside the normal realm of what you think love is. And you'll see what I mean when I talk about it. And what I'm asking you to do is to make your own parallels here, okay? 
Now, I'm going to give you three examples, and then we're, then we're going to finish the evening. And the point of this is, as we recognize our own holy instance, our own, put it this way, remember that bubble I was talking about with all the love outside of it, and we're inside the bubble? These spikes of love that I'm going to tell you about, it's like, it's like on the outside, there, somebody's whispering through the bubble. And once in a while, we get it, OK? And so here it is, you know. Uh, so let me tell you, tell you about it. And by the way, I have to tell you, I will probably be a, an inveterate tapper up here, because if, if I don't, I'll end up being a puddle, OK? So anyway, the first one has to do with my daughter, Tina. Now I'm going to cry already. Um, she, she will not remember this. She was one year old. And, and uh, we were in our living room on a Saturday afternoon. And Tina was on the other side of the room playing. And she suddenly stopped and looked at me, one year old, and toddled on over with these great big eyes, you know. She grabbed me by my ears, pulled my head down, and kissed me on the lips. Okay. And she had these big eyes, big eyes. <laughs> I get it just a minute. These big I love you eyes. And this wasn't just a, a little instance of love. This spiked. This was a different kind of love. This, this was love that was different than the father who was changing the diapers, you know. It was a whole different thing, and it took me to a whole, whole different level, you know. Um, another one I have is. Uh, one of our veterans a, a while back, five other EFTers and myself got together for several days applying EFT to, to our war veterans. And one of the veterans there was named Bob. And Bob was very skeptical. Uh, he lived on the other side of the country. We, the whole thing was, San, was in San Francisco. He lived on the other side of the country. He had to get an airplane to come there. He, the only reason he came is because other vets were going to be there and because I paid his way in this hotel bill and he'd get free food and he was out of a job, okay? <laughs> but he, he thought the whole thing, he used every four-letter word in the, in the book, you know, this is BS, I don't know why I'm doing this. I've, you know, I've tried to commit suicide several times. I've been to every psychiatric shrink in the VA and the Bob, I mean, on and on and on and on. You can't, what is this? You're going to do what, what, you know? Over and over and over again. So he comes and on a Sunday evening we have a, we have a kind of an orientation, and we're going to start on Monday. And so Monday comes, and I, I take Bob under my wing. Other people work with him, but I spent most of my time with him. And I'd work with him, and Tuesday morning came, and everybody comes in the room, and, and uh, he's not yelling anymore and arguing, but he's not doing anything else either. He's just sort of there, okay? Other guys were saying, hey, I had a good night's sleep last night. Wednesday morning came, and he walked into he walked into the room, and his eyes met mine with the same "I love you" eyes I had for my daughter. And here comes the spike. Okay. Now I hope you're recognizing with your clients these spikes you have with your own clients. Do you ever have them? How many have had these kind of spikes? Okay. These are to be paid attention to because they are outside the normal realm of love. They come and they go, okay? It's a whisper through the bubble. And come to find out that night, he had slept through the entire night, first time he could remember. Um, did not wake up any time swinging his fist, did not sweat during the night. Uh, his intrusive memories appeared to be gone. And he was just immensely grateful. And this look in his eye, he didn't know how, you know, guys, you know, that, uh, they know, he didn't know how to say it. But he did with his eyes, and later on, later on, he, he wrote me something that says, I love you, man, you know. But the real spike was that look in his eyes. It was very momentary, you know, and so I invite you to go back into your own life and, and think of those things. And, and what we want to do is recognize them, and the more we recognize them, what they are, the more we say, ah, there's something else outside there. It's a beginning, okay? There's other disciplines, too. I mean, if you want to study the Course in Miracles, there's all kinds of lessons and other things, there are other spiritual disciplines to get you along this path, but this is the path we need to go. And the final one I'm going to tell you about has to do with team. Um, 
I know most of you have been on teams of one kind, of, if not a sports team, you know, a family team, a business team, a therapy team. With your own clients, you're a team. The two of you are working together, team. And what I want to do is I want to tell you a little story. In, in 2008, well, be, my hometown is Riverside, California. It's about, it's about a two-hour drive from the San Diego here, area here. And if you go to the center of that town, it's a town of about 400,000 people, there's a wall, there's a great big wall there that is called the Riverside Sport Hall of Fame. And on that wall are some very famous athletes that came from Riverside. They include Reggie Miller, who's a pro basketball Hall of Fame. They include Bobby Bonds, who's a pro baseball Hall of Fame. They include Olympic gold medalists. They include pro, pro athletes of many kinds. And, ta-da, me. Okay. Now, I was, this is in 2008, I was told that I was going to be given this honor. And let me tell you, that ego of mine got shot right up. Oh man, hot dog, you know? Because <laughs> I'm going to go to Riverside, you know, and I'm going to, I'm going to be decorated, if you will. And, and it, this was not some small deal. I mean, they, the, the amount of people that were in that room were 800 people, about three times what's here, okay? And the band was playing, and they had you up on a podium, and you, you know, they had a, a lunch for you ahead of time, and it was a real big thing. And of course, the ego goes, ah, ah. Yes, yes, yes. I'm glad you finally recognized me. You know? <laughs> but one thing I've learned over time is that my ego is a fool. <laughs> okay? And so what I did, it, 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 coming to this event was the a football team, and my, my high school football team, and this was the, the experience that I had that where I get all the things happened where I was selected as being this athlete. Um, and it was, really was an extraordinary season. But the, the, the point is, these guys all came supposedly to honor me. That's the whole thing. Ego, 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 Gary, 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 Gary. Thank you, thank you. Yes, I deserve it. Yes. So here they come. And I recognized that this really wasn't about me. It really wasn't about me. Yeah, the ego likes it and all that. So in my acceptance talk, if you will, I uh, created a poem about this team. Now this, this team is an unusual team. We called it the Nobody Brigade because there was nobody on this team. The team before us, the year before us, had all kinds of, of superb athletes. They were tall, they were fast, they were big. Uh, some of them went under college football, some went under the pros and so on, and they all graduated and we were left with nothing. We were the bench warmers from the year before, plus some sophomores and juniors, you know, who had very little experience. So we had nothing. Okay? So that night, ah, this is, this is a picture of the Nobody Brigade, at least half of them. Uh, the picture didn't get them all. And I had them standing at one point. And that's them standing there with pride. But the reason they're standing with pride is because I created a poem, which I'm going to recite for you, and we're going to finish with that poem. In fact, if you'll notice there, I'm wearing a red jacket. And I happen to have brought the same jacket with me only because I want to pay tribute to my buddies. And I want to do it properly, because they are probably going to see this. So let me put that jacket on. In fact, let me see. Ah, yes, I even have a gold medal. Okay. So, my teammates are sitting down. They're roughly over there. Okay. And I told them in advance that the latter part of this poem, I was going to ask them to stand up. They didn't know what the poem was about. I was just going to ask them to stand up. I said, I said, you know, this is our last play. Okay, so let's get it right. When I, when I ask you to stand, you stand up, okay? So they did. Uh, and so let me recite that poem to you. But the, the purpose of this poem is to understand, 
understand that we need to get out of our own egos. We need to understand team. We need to understand what's really happening in this world. And as you hear this poem and experience this with me, I'm hoping you are drawing up your own parallels because at the end of this, I'm going to give you the opportunity to applaud my team. Okay? But you don't need to applaud my team. The applause really needs to be for your experiences that are like this team. So anyway, the poem. It was the year 57 when we first donned our gear. A nobody brigade. There were no stars here. We had a few seniors. Last year's bench we did warm. And some sophomores and juniors who we hoped could perform. Even our coach, we must admit, was a rookie himself, Coach Hammerschmidt. Only three or four players had any real speed. The rest did their best using spirit as creed. And did we have size? Not even close. Not a bruiser among us. Our school was morose. We were little guys, all sent from heaven with an average weight of 167. <laughs> our school principal also gave up his hope. He cut our budget and shortened our rope. <laughs> Losers we were, or so others thought, but that idea we never bought. So we assembled and practiced and did so as one, perfecting our plays in the hot riverside sun. As we got into shape, our muscles did scream, but from out of that effort came a team with a gleam. We had our first scrimmage and came out on top, surprising indeed those who thought we would flop. Then came our first game. We were no longer shelved because we beat Santa Ana 33 to 12. <laughs> the city was pleased, the naysayers went mute because the nobody brigade was bearing some fruit. Um, Redondo was next. We thought they were heroes, but we sent them home limping, limping 41 to 0. And then came Fontana uh, to meet our 11, and we thrashed them unmercifully 53 to 7. And so on it went, game after game. Every Friday night was more of the same. We were CBL champs and did so with ease. The Nobody Brigade, the city did please. The CIF playoffs were next on our list. How would we do? Did we have enough grist? Out of 500 high schools, we played the best. For us, of course, was the ultimate test. Antelope Valley was who we first fought, and we thwarted their hopes, 41 to not. Then came a royal. Could we again crack the whip? We sent them home. We pounded them soundly, 39 to zip. To the semifinals, we did ascend, where a referee's error caused our season to end. We were disappointed, of course, though superb to the core. Out of 500 high schools, we were in the top four. With our heads held high, some records still stand. The Nobody Brigade left its mark on this land. So how do we do this without size or speed? How could we do even one of those deeds? Because dedication and purpose towards a singular goal where egos subside and the team takes the role. There were no complainers to be found on our team and no prima donnas to siphon our steam. Together we worked and together we played and with that spirit, our achievements were made. A team without size or speed and all that, who efforts together was tough to combat. It was love in our spirit that delivered our flow and created within us a formidable foe. Now I'm gonna Stop here for a moment. Because the last part of this poem is coming up, and this is where I ask my teammates to stand up. And this is where this, this moment came, OK? This moment was not a Gary moment, if you will, even though that's the stage for all of this. It was an us moment. And these guys stood up with pride. <laughs> they stood up with pride. It was, it was, it was one. Not all of us. We all knew what we went through. We all knew what had happened. And the look in their eyes at that moment was one of those spikes. Okay. So my coach and my teammates, I ask you to stand. Please hold your applause as we speak man to man. 
Well, this award does indeed bear my name. It was our tireless effort that created this flame. Those touchdowns and yards were not mine alone. Together we did this, so this trophy we own. You sent me to Stanford, a magnificent gift. My gratitude is endless. So I close with a lift by inviting the audience to stand in applause to honor the magic that together we caused. Okay. That's it for the evening. I hope I've opened a door or two for you. Um, if you want to follow my version of all of this on, on the website GaryThink.com, that's what I'm going to be doing. And it may or may not be your path. Hopefully you'll find some ideas in it. And we will together move along this path. Now, what I really enjoy doing after this, for those who are interested, is I have unlimited hugs. And those who are interested, I'll be right down here and I'll share them with you. Good night.